Ai, Rosa, muito. In 1941, in the DK Catholic Meeting Hall, the Nazis and their collaborators assembled around 1,000 Jews from Bolochov. Today, the hall serves as a fitness gym. Excerpts from the testimony of Mrs. Rivka Monchain as given on August 20th, 1946. At 12 o'clock, they began snatching Jews off the streets and from their homes. They brutally herded them into a heated hall. The stifling heat was unbearable. People lay on top of one another. Many suffocated or died from being beaten on the head with rifles. Shantia Reisler was forced to dance naked on the bodies of the dead to the joyful tunes played by Brockenstein, the blind musician. The body of Rabbi Horowitz was brutally torn to pieces. Rabbi Landau, stripped naked, was forced by the Gestapo to give a speech in praise of Germany. His eyes were gouged out because he refused to look at the naked women. How did the Jewish community of Bolochov, a small village in the Ukraine, one of hundreds of Jewish towns in Galicia, merit having three authors document its destruction in three unique ways? Daniel Mendelssohn, a professor of classic literature from New York, wrote an account of the mysterious events in the life of his uncle Shmiel, his wife Esther, and their four beautiful daughters, who remained in Bolochov and were murdered by the Nazis. The Lost in Search of Six of Six Million became a bestseller, the New York Times Book of the Year. The whole point of my book is not to make the sentimental error that you can imagine what others' experiences are like and act on that fantasy accordingly. The whole point of my book is that people are specific and have specific experiences and that's what we have to remind ourselves, that it's not one big emotional you know, swimming pool that we can all jump in and out of and feel good about ourselves or bad about ourselves. Anatole Renier, a German author, was fascinated by the story following his marriage to Nechama Hendel, a famous Israeli singer whose father, Dr. Michael Hendel, was a native of Bolochov. When I was 18, I uh, went to Israel. Why? With my guitar, I don't know, a sense of guilt, I suppose, to, to, uh, to see for myself, to see the Jewish people for myself, you see. And I was a good guitar player at the time. I made many friends, and I met Nehama Handel, and we got married some years later. Renier interviewed the survivors, researched the story through official Nazi documents, and wrote Then in Bolochov. This is the strength of the book that it is more or less, I wouldn't say unemotional, but it is of a, it is not, uh, it is qu has a quiet tone to it, you see. And when you tell things in a quiet tone, they are mostly more effective than if you shout and make a lot of noise. Shlomo Adler was 13 when his entire family was murdered in Bolochov. His desperate hold on life helped him survive the Holocaust, emigrate illegally to Israel and fight in the War of Independence. Only recently, 65 years later, was he able to put into words the story of his life in his book, A Jew Again. הייעוד שלי להשאיר איזה עקבות, כי אם זה ייעלם לא יישאר שום 
סימן שיהודים היו שם. כל הבתים האלה מצד ימין, אלה בתים של יהודים שהיו גר כאן. זה מספרה של גרדנר. זה טפר, רופא שיניים טפר. פה בערך היה בית של, של ריין ארצי. פה הייתה גרה משפחת יגר. פה מצד שמאל יש לנו בית של משפחת גרישלק. פה בפינה היה גר משפחת צימרמן. The forefathers of the Jaegers, the Adlers, the Greenschlags, the Teppers and the Zimmermans were invited by a Polish lord 350 years ago to settle in a private town that he founded on his estate in Galicia. He promised them equal rights with the Christians, a plot of land on which to build houses and shops, and even a free lot to build a synagogue. The Jews were an economic force that transformed Bolochov into the most flourishing city in the region. A third of the population were Jews, a third Poles, and a third Ukrainian. 4,500 Jews lived in the city. Only 48 survived after the Holocaust. Shlomo Adler, chairman of the Association of Former Residents of Bolochov in Israel, hurries to a meeting in City Hall. Ever since 1660, when being sworn into office, each city mayor pledged to maintain the rights of all three segments of the population and to protect them. During the Holocaust, the pledge was buried in the cellars of City Hall, then used as a prison for the persecuted Jews. <laughs> ודיברתי עם אמא, והוא האשים את אבא שלי שחתך אותו מהחבל. הוא אומר, מי יודע איזה עינויים עוד מחכים לנו. The interaction with the Ukrainian establishment is emotionally charged due to the weight of the shared history. Seventy years after the horrors of the Holocaust, the fates of two people from opposite sides intersect in Bolochov. Dr. Cornelius Matovetsky, a 60-year-old neurologist, a Ukrainian-born American, now living in Dallas, Texas, is also searching for an answer to a question that might upheave his world. What part did his late father, a policeman in Bolochov, play in the murder of Jews in the town? I get a letter from my brother, and he's saying that he read Daniel Mendelssohn's book, and sure enough, that here's the father's name, Matvietsky, and who, who wants to know that the father is involved in, you know, I mean, to me, it, 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 you know, it's a shock. What a legacy, <laughs> you know, what a legacy. אני שמעתי את השם מטוויאצקי, אני אף פעם לא ראיתי אותו. ידעתי שהוא פחד, כולם פחדו ממנו. הוא התפאר שהוא רצח 390 יהודי בולוכוב. Balakhov survivors and second and third generation descendants of survivors from the US, Israel and Bolivia came to the town in the summer of 2009 to take part in the memorial services for the community. The 300-year-old cemetery lying in the shade of huge trees serves as testimony to the glorious past of the Jewish community. Tet Ayn Pe Ayn Resh, Aharon Tepper, who was my, one of my wife's uh, uh, ancestors. 
In cooperation with the Bolochov municipality and funded by former residents of the city from around the world, a new wall was built around the old Jewish cemetery. Piles of trash that accumulated in years of neglect are cleared away at the last minute for the official inauguration ceremony tomorrow. But one small detail was overlooked. אנחנו רואים כאן דמות של דוב. הדוב כאן הוא בעצם משמש כסמל משפחתי. היופי של המצבה הזאת היא הצורה של האס בעצם, שזאת צורה שהייתה מאוד מקובלת במאה ה-18, אם חושבים למשל על סגנון הרוקוקו. The headstone with the bear emblem probably belonged to the family of Dov Bear Birkenthal, who published books in Hebrew as early as the 18th century. Jewish culture and scholarship flourished in Galicia. Only in Lvov is a song written by Jews. 100,000 Jews lived in this major city in Galicia and were the economic and cultural force throughout all of Galicia. Polish, Yiddish and German were spoken by all Galician Jews and their cultural life flourished. In Bolochov, in the Tarbut schools, they also learned Hebrew. Purim was the children's favorite holiday. On that holiday, Shlomo decided to dress up as a funny clown. <laughs> בגיל שמונה פתאום נתנו לי שם סטניסלב. זה היה נורא מוזר לי. ושאלתי למה. הוא, תשמע, היה לה אפשרות לקרוא לך ש... סלומון. היו אפשרות לקרוא לך שלומו. זה ש... לא, לא שם שמצלצל יפה פה ב- 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 באזור שלנו. ואז הבנתי גם שאני לא כדאי שאני אגדל פיות. ואז הבנתי גם שיהודי זה לא... In 1941, Hitler breached his agreement with Stalin about the division of Poland and invaded the Ukraine. The Ukrainians who had suffered during the communist occupation welcomed the German invaders with an orgy of persecution and murder of Jews. Even before the Germans marched in, free reign was given in Bolochov. <laughs> הרוסי יצא, זה היה בשנת 41. מה הם עשו? הם יצאו לרחובות עם שקים ועם גרזינים. ובלילה אחד הוציאו 120 יהודים מהמיטות והרגו אותם וזרקו לנהר. אצלנו היה נהר. סופר. איזה נהר. The Ukrainian police were appointed to enforce the racial laws and decrees that the Germans imposed upon the Galician Jews. In Bolochov, policeman Motovetsky excelled at fulfilling this task. Motovetsky, <laughs> 
אז האוקראינים החברים יצאו, הם ראו דרך החלון, יצאו, והתחילו והסבירו לו, אז נתנו לי ללכת. פתאום שמענו יריעה, וראינו איזה בחורה רצה, וראינו שוטר רץ, ואחר כך ראינו שוטר חוזר, והבחורה איננה, והוא לא מלווה אותה. אז ראינו חברה מהכיתה שלי, שהיא שוכבת יריעה, חיוורת, מתה. אחרי זה השוטר האוקראיני, הוא סיפר לי שהוא ירה בה והרג אותה. הייתה אקציה, אומר, ראיתי שהיא מנסה לברוח, יריתי בה וזהו. קראו לה גינה מנדל. as I call it, intimate killing was like. Neighbors turning on neighbors, you know, this kind of thing. You realize how thin civilization really is, how very thin it is and how easily it cracks. The first action in October 1941 that began in the Catholic Deca meeting hall was meticulously planned by the Nazis against the Jewish scholars and elite to break the spirit of the Jewish community. אביך היה כאן? כן. אביך היה כאן? הוא לא יעשה חי מפה. After 36 hours, 900 Jews in shock, beaten and maimed were let out. They were led under heavy guard to the nearby Tanyava forest. My uncle Shmiel, you know, was a guy, he had a business, insurance policies, everything that we have. He pay, was paying too much for his kids to go to school. He was fetching about the school fees. He, you know, they were worrying about how to, to pay for the older girl, the younger girl. They, you know, they had normal bourgeois middle class lives. And the entire structure of that life disintegrated under their feet. And it took about two weeks for the entire civilization in which they had been cocooned, shattered. The action in Bolochov was the beginning of mass murder according to the slogan One Bullet, One Jew. And it continued as the German army advanced into the Ukraine and Russia. The Einsatzgruppen German death squads, assisted by the local militia, shot more than one million Jews to death. This is the road on which 1,000 desolate Jews were led from the Deka to their deaths in the Tanyava forest. Here they still remember what happened 70 years ago. Пеша, все скучло, и старше, и малые дети, и внучки, и немцы до около. И с одной стороны, с другой стороны. When they reached the forest, the naked Jews stood on a plank, were shot and fell into a pit, some still alive. The Jews of Bolochov were forced to pay the price of the bullets that pierced the bodies of their loved ones. The patriotic monument of the wounded Russian soldier waving the flag of victory was erected after the war at the entrance to Bolochov. The Red Army never forgave the Ukrainians for cooperating with the Nazis. Collaborators were immediately executed. In 1946, the policeman murderer Matovietsky fled from the Russians from Bolochov to Poland, but the Russian security forces did not give up. Andela, who lived in Prague, wrote a letter whatever, saying that the KGB came to her door asking that she had a picture of my father or something that when the Soviets came 
they want to know where my father was or whatever, and she hid this photograph, and I think that somehow somebody was surveilling the family. And then the, there was just some hints by my brother or whatever, maybe he didn't say anything, that my father may have been up to things in the past. Rumor has it that in the town of Rozdol, near Bolochov, the sister of Matovetsky, the Bolochov butcher, still lives. Shlomo feels the need to confront her face to face. Sofia Matovetsky, an 80-year-old widow and devout Christian, invites us into her tidy house. After the first action, life went on as usual, or so it seemed. The trains departed and arrived on time. Shlomo's father, who had managed a leather factory for the Nazis, was accused of theft and sent to prison. His mother rounded up a large sum of money to free him. The bribe was taken, but she was arrested. A moment before she was sent to jail, she sent Shlomo home to bring her some warm socks at the train station. <laughs> (laughs) 
Miriam, who recently celebrated her 90th birthday, owes her long life to Dina. For 13 months, Dina hid Miriam and her husband in the lion's den, the crawl space above the bathroom in the Gestapo officers' club in Bolochov. Dina, the only living offspring of her family, posed as a Ukrainian. Together with her friend Marika, she worked as a waitress in the restaurant of the German club. But many others had claims against God. This synagogue remained intact, but all its worshippers perished. It's hard not to be impressed by its size and beauty, testimony to the power and wealth of the Jews of Bolochov. In a photo from the beginning of the last century, we see the Rinek, the bustling marketplace in Bolochov. All the shops had been owned by Jews for 300 years. The Jews' flair for business became known throughout the world. A Galicianer was the nickname for a sharp-witted Jew, one who could get along. This shop hasn't changed much since the Jewish watchmaker sat here. Jews engaged in all trades, learning a profession such as medicine or law was the dream of every Jewish mother in Galicia, even back then. My uncles were um, a, an accountant, um, a bookkeeper, and a doctor. And my aunts were both lawyers who had gone to school in Vienna in the early 1920s. You gotta have a little muzzle. Muzzle means good luck. Cause the sky's the limit was the inscription on a New Year's card sent from America to Jews in Galicia. Millions of Jews sold their meager belongings and set out west to the land of limitless opportunities. In Eastern Europe, millions remained, thus sealing their fate to perish at the hands of the Nazis. In his book The Lost, Mendelssohn writes about his grandfather in America who was tormented by not having the ability to help his brother Schmiel, who kept sending desperate letters from Bolochow. There is this sort of generalized guilt on the part of Jewish Americans uh, with respect to their relatives in Europe who perished during the war just because they were lucky, you know, they didn't suffer. They had, you know, because of some decision somebody made 30 years earlier, they were in Ottawa or New York City or San Francisco and their brother was still in Bolochov. The branches of the youth movements, Zionist Youth, Hashomer Hatzair, Beitar and Gordonia, prepared the youth, both physically and emotionally, to become pioneers in the land of Israel. But the way to Palestine was blocked by the British, who ruled there at the time. Of all the young girls in the Zionist Youth Movement in Bolochov seen here in their prime of youth, not one survived the Holocaust. The only way to survive was to find work that would benefit the Germans. 
Luckily, Bolochov had a developed leather industry and the Germans needed leather for the boots of soldiers and officers. In his book, Anatole Renier is very meticulous about historic precision. And, it so happens, that the Nazis kept detailed lists of everything. I'm holding in my hand a list of October 1942 from the German administration of Bolochov. A list of all the Jews that were working in the different factories and industrial uh, plants. The biggest employer was the Hobak, Holzbau AG. That was a German uh, wood processing plant and there were 215 men, 104 women. And the other big employer was the Fassfabrik, the barrel factory, 72 men, 203 women. The factories paid no wages. Workers settled for a ladle of murky soup. In addition to forced labor that the Jews had to endure, the Nazis systematically robbed them of their possessions. If one had no money or property and couldn't work, his or her fate was sealed. The second Aktion in Bolochov in September 1942 was much bigger and more violent than the first. More than 2,000 Jews were gathered around City Hall. Now it's painted pink, but then it was red from the blood of the dead. An excerpt from the testimony of Matilda Gelernter in 1946. They snatched men, women and children from homes, from work and hiding places. The Ukrainians captured 660 children. They held them by their legs and smashed their heads against the sidewalk. The Ukrainian Matovetsky boasted of having single-handedly killed 96 Jews, mostly children. Mrs. Greenberg was dragged to the town square while in labor. After she gave birth, they tore the child from the umbilical cord and the Ukrainian mob trampled the child to death. The mother was forced to stand for hours by the wall of City Hall with bloody pieces of afterbirth dangling between her legs. <laughs> After three days of inhumane forms of torture, the Jews were marched to the train station and were forced to sing My Small Town Builds, a cruel joke about their final destination, the extermination camp Belzitz. Dina experienced the horrors of the ride to Belzitz and lived to tell. הכניסו אותנו בכוח, לתוך, פתחו את ה... כמו, כמו שיש ברכבת של בהימות, ולא היה שם, עוד לא מחדק היה, והרגשנו שאנחנו כבר ראיתי איך ש... איך ש... כל המשפחה הזה, אי אפשר לתאר, סבתא אולי אפילו לא... לא. אז היו אנשים יותר צעירים, אז התחילו שם, היה, הייתה מין חלון כזה, לא גדול, זה לא חלון, זה, זה ברזל עם, עם חלודה כזו, אתה יודע, והם הצליחו להוציא, אז אני אומרת, אני הולכת לצו, ל, ל, לקפוץ. אז אבא שלי אמר, ואני לא אשכח את זה אף פעם, לכי, לכי בבקשה, אולי תש, תשארי זכר מהמשפחה. Ich 
When the train reached the extermination camp Belzitz, the railway cars were emptied of their human cargo within three to five minutes. As if on a meticulously planned, horrifically efficient conveyor belt, they were led directly to the gas chambers. Within a few hours, 2,000 Bolokh of Jews were obliterated. After 1,000 Jews perished in the first action in the DK club, and 2,000 more in the second one, which began at City Hall, the Jews who survived wavered between hope and despair. Jews rushed about from one Ukrainian neighbor to another, offering large sums of money if they would agree to hide them. 13-year-old Shlomo and 14-year-old Yuzhik were alone in the world. They didn't give up. They looked for shelter with the Raduchovsky family, who had been business partners and friends of the Adlers before the war. They had to approach the family's house secretly, without being spotted by the suspicious eyes of the neighbors. Anyone caught hiding Jews would be sentenced to death. This is Nadia. This is the, the daughter of the only son of, of, Mrs. of, of Mr. Radochowski, the only son. The Radochowskis had one son, 12-year-old Michal, who knew the secret. The mother, Maria, had to be wary of her anti-Semitic brother and of the priest. She, she made the sign of the cross. And she said to us something like this. I had to play in front of my family, in front of, the, of my priest for a year. Not like an artist on the stage one time, one a week, one a month, a year, day by day. I had to lie Why, when I was giving my, uh, in, the, in the church, when I... Uh, confession. Confession. You imagine this? After Maria's death, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem awarded Maria Raduchowski's granddaughter, Nadia, the Righteous Among the Nations medal in honor of the family. Friedrich Katzmann, the Nazi in charge of murdering the Jews of Galicia, documented on film the bunkers uncovered by the Gestapo. Creativity, tenacity, and very small hiding places were necessary to hide from the stalking eyes of the Gestapo forces. That left those in hiding a most inhumane living area. זה היה מחסן של כל מיני מצרכים. הוא קיצר את המחסן באיזה חמישים סנטימטר. אנחנו ישבנו פה, זה היה צמוץ, צמוץ לאסם. שנה שלמה, פה. לא יכולנו לשכב על הגף. היינו צריכים לשכב על הצד, ביחד להסתובב, ימינה או שמאלה. שלושה עשר חדשים. כמה? שלושה עשר חדשים. ולא <laughs> 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 In his journal on July 26, 1943, Katzman notes his horrific deeds. 
בסך הכל 434,329 יהודים אוס גזידלט, איך לתרגם את המילה הזאת? זאת אומרת, הם הוצאו להתיישבות. זה הלשון הקוד. The Jews were wiped off the face of the earth in Galicia. The magnificent synagogue in the township of Stri near Bolochov stands today as a silent testimony to the destruction that so few survived. The general public hadn't realized what it took to survive the Holocaust even if you were not in one of the camps. You see, because the camps are very well documented. There are many books written about it, photographs, films. But that it was... that you had to hide in the forest, that you had to dig yourself into the earth, you had to disappear from the face of the earth. Is it in your bunker? Yes. 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 Dr. Stanley Ostern from California is trying to find the hiding place in which he spent two years of his life. He was a child of seven when he entered the bunker. He came out an old man of nine. It was built for 12, 15 people. We had 35. People came, so I found out about the bunker. The, you know what's going to happen? They said they're going to tell the Germans. So. Exactly the same story as with the Grinchlags. That's why yeah. There were fights. See, the problem was we had to pay Starka, who was hiding us. And a lot of people had gold pieces, you know, Russian or American gold pieces. Uh, some people didn't want to part with them, so they had body searches. My uncle was the enforcer. They had body searches, and people said, oh, this person got more, more bread than I did. He was constantly scared and hungry. In order to hide 35 Jews in a bunker, one needed a brilliant plan. There was a false cellar here. Okay. Lifting up, cellar this way, okay? False cellar, wall, crawl under the wall. And then Starko would cover the wall, would cover the hole, okay? So we had no escape except that hole. And the air supply told you it was well, the chimney. Well, if there was a hole over there, and if it was underneath yeah, here, yeah. there would be except No, just there wasn't. Good idea, but there wasn't any. <laughs> Next time I need a bunker, I'll call you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Out of 100,000 Jews in Lvov, a mere 4,000 survived after the war. In Lvov's old city near the ruined synagogue, a Ukrainian entrepreneur opened up a Jewish-style restaurant more as a tourist gimmick than to meet community needs. Yeah. The menu doesn't indicate the price of the dishes. The owner explains that Jews always haggle over prices. The centuries-old racist stereotypes that existed below the surface for Ukrainians, Poles and Jews erupted like a volcano under the Nazis. Some of the things I've re read in Daniel's book, I, I don't even want to imagine uh, because it, it's, uh, the thought of it is, is very revolting. And then I, when I read it, some of the kids having their heads bashed, I, 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 I just hope that my father wasn't one who did stupid things like that. 
and I and I, I asked, talked with Jack, and Jack said that he remembered him once getting on his bike very quickly with a rifle, and then driving off somewhere, and then not that long after there were six, seven, or I don't know, there were several shots, and then the next day found that seven or eight Jews were killed. The Ukraine blossoms in summer. Apple trees are laden with fruit. The pastoral atmosphere successfully covers up all that happened here during those horrifying years. At the home of farmer Hoshovsky, it is as if time has stood still. Even today, there is no running water and no electricity. ב-1943 הופיעו בבית שלהם שתי יהודים וביקשו אוכל. היו נראו איום ונורא. האימא הכינה איזה אוכל ונתנה להם. כשהגיע הסתף והתחיל לעקור, הציעו להם שהם יבנו בשבילהם מערה ויביאו להם מדי פעם אוכל. There was more of a chance to find a hiding place in the forest. The Greenschlags, a father and two sons, also chose to hide in the cave. Despite the danger, the young Hoshovsky fed three families. והיה מוריד עם חבל לכאן את, ה... את המצרכים. הם היו שמים בתוך הסל כסף, והוא היה, הם, הם קונים עוד פעם ועוד פעם. אבל הם היו מבשלים בלילה. The smell of smoke reached the Ukrainian neighbor, who used to roam the forests in search of Jews in hiding and would turn them over to the Nazis for money. He discovered the cave and turned in its dwellers. They were shot on the spot. Hoshovsky secretly buried their bodies. They have no memorial, only a name. Shlomo tries to find out who turned in those three families. He is about to make an amazing discovery. All the leaders in the county are invited to the inauguration ceremony of the fence surrounding the cemetery. The priest of the Greek Orthodox Ukrainians, the Polish Catholic priest, and the city hall officials, all full of goodwill to preserve the memory of the Bolokh of Jews. Antisemitism Nazis were born with Satanism in the Third Reich. They were forced to break the moral commandments and the commandments of God. She called herself the judgment від Бога, бо його не послухала Бога, а послухала злу силу, що була покарана осудженням Божим. All the speakers try to conceal their common problematic past. Matilda! Only Israeli-born Barak, whose grandfather was born here, can no longer be politically correct and with bitter outcry sings a song he had written himself in Yiddish. Beautiful. It has an inscription of the Balch of Shul, 
Shoma brought it. And here it's Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohein Adonai Echad. In English. Who donated this? You know? You want to know? No. I'd love to. You will hear. You will hear. А что в селе там, там были евреи и желчения? Alex Dunai, a historian from Lvov, specializes in guiding Jews who are looking for their roots in Galicia. He also helped the author Daniel Mendelssohn find the key man who could answer the question how his uncle Shmiel had died. The most important information we got from this Mr. Prokopiev. If this man was died two years or three years earlier, not now, I don't think that uh, Mendelssohn would, would be able to write his book. Shmiel Jaeger and his daughter Fritka hid, the neighbor says, in the cellar of two Polish teachers on Kopernikus Street in the center of town. Two women in the courtyard don't know very much. They bought a house after the war, but their house does have a cellar. Under the floorboards, they discover a trap door that hides the cellar. One can see this exact type of secret door in a collection of photographs of hideaways in the diary of the Nazi Katzman. According to new testimonies, the neighbors saw smoke billowing out of the chimney when the teachers were supposed to be in school. That is how Shmiel Jaeger and his daughter were found and turned in. After the war, Adler decides to hide his Jewish origin. He enlists in the Polish police force and goes to serve in Warsaw. A young man Shlomo, only 16 years old, soon becomes the right-hand man of the Polish deputy police commander, Colonel Mawetski. The Jews who survived the Holocaust in Bolochow tell Shlomo that Matowiecki, the mass murderer, is hiding in Poland. Shlomo uses his connections with the Polish police. A group of policemen sets out to make the arrest. Colonel Mawetski and his assistant Shlomo joined them. Dr. Cornelius Matovetsky, the son of the murderer policeman from Bolochov, who was seemingly killed 60 years ago, has an emotional need to meet the survivors face to face. He flies to Australia and meets the survivor Jack Green. He also asks Shlomo Adler if he would meet him in Israel. I 
על שם ארבע, על שם אז עברתי, אבל מצד שני סקרן אותי הדבר. מי בא פה? מישהו מעולם האמת. In the lobby of a hotel in Tel Aviv, Dr. Matovietsky meets Shlomo Adler and the German author Anatol Renier. Dr. Matovietsky tells them that his father and mother fled from the Russians to Poland and from there to Germany and France. In 1950, the family emigrated to Canada as war refugees. Until his death, 15 years ago, the father kept his past concealed. If so, who was killed 60 years ago? <laughs> הגענו לאיזה בניין של מישהו אחר, שגם הוא לא היה צדיק גדול, שהיות והוא ירה עלינו. ואנחנו חיסלנו, חיסלנו את הבן אדם לא נכון. As fate would have it, Dr. Matovietsky, a devout Christian from Dallas, Texas, is a warm supporter of the Jewish people. He says that he visited Israel five times and even volunteered as a doctor in hospital in Naharia. And all this happened before he became aware of the details of his father's horrid past as the murder of the Bolach of Jews. I feel at home in this country. I love Israel. I love Jewish people. I will come over here and fight. I will come here and help medically. Uh, I will take a stand. After the meeting, Dr. Matovietsky goes to the Ukraine, travels to the common grave in the Tanyava forest, and begins to clear out the overgrown foliage by himself. In the summer of 2009, when the group of survivors and their families arrive for the memorial ceremony in the forest, the place is tidy and well-groomed. Dr. Matovietsky, the son of a murderer, gave the cousins Yuzhik and Shlomo Adler and Jack Green a gold-plated shofar designed by an artist from Jerusalem, the very same shofar that was blown during the memorial service. The mystery of what happened to Uncle Shmiel and his family, the obsession that consumed him for many years, was solved by Daniel Mendelssohn. But since then, his life has been altered. If you want to know how it changed my life, I'll tell you how it changed my life. Every time I am on a subway platform, like after I finished my book, I found myself always playing this mental game. I would look at a person waiting for a subway and I would think, is that person a killer? Is that a person who's capable of clubbing a child to death? Or is that person <clears throat> a savior? Is that someone who's going to risk his life to hide his neighbor? And I can't stop playing this Meshuggah game now. And I, that's how my life has changed. It's, you feel like you're on very slippery ground when you used to think that you were safe. Я не не снимайте все, хватит, хватит. Ава, дякую. Дякую. Ты что такая, вот так ты что? 